Yo, what's going on E7 fam? Pat here, back with another History of E7 video. You guys have been asking for this for months, right? So many people in every stream, when are we gonna make the next History of E7 video? Because, you know, it's been several months. If you recall where we last left it off, we talked about uh, both Tamarin here, who was trash upon release, as well as Epic 7's best waifu of all time, Luna, and how much joy and happiness she brought to the community. Well, if you look here on Cecilia Bot's amazing timeline, the Wayback Machine, as I call it, the next major release we have to talk about is Silverblade Araminta. And if you took a look at the thumbnail or the name of the video, this is the character that basically ruined Epic 7. She's the one that set everything in motion. And I've been putting it off for a while for two major reasons. Uh, one, if you look at all the tabs at the top of your screen, it's going to take quite a while for me to tell the tale of Araminta and the damage that she dealt to this game, the irreparable damage. Um, and two, it doesn't paint some of Epic Seven's history in a very positive light, but I do think it's important for us to talk about it so that, that way you could kind of get an idea of where Smallgate and Super Creative are coming with some of their decisions. So when I see comments like this one on my videos, you know why you're frustrated and why they're probably not going to make certain changes. So yeah, needless to say, three months ago or so when I was making these history videos a bit more frequently, uh, the game was in a bit more dire straits. Now that we have had the Overlord collab and, you know, our spirits have been uplifted a bit, I think it's safe to talk about it without getting people dejected and lowering the morale of uh, the community. So I kind of wanted to pick and choose my moment for this one because, um, no pun intended, it's a pretty incendiary topic here, right? So let's get on with it and talk about Silverblade Araminta, the perhaps villain of Epic Seven. I know some people might think of other characters like maybe Arbiter Vildred, which we will talk about him in this video, but Silverblade Araminta was the character that put everything in motion. So let's talk about Silverblade Araminta who came out here as you can see uh, at the beginning of March of 2019. So this was the second ever Mystic Metal Moonlight 5-star after Specimen says, which we talked about last time. So here's the character's kit. Flame Friction with its 65-75% to 75 chance to burn on the S1. The S2 gives you 30% CR if you hit a burned enemy and you obviously get that big AoE attack. And the big one, Meteor Fall, which has a 50% chance to inflict not one, not two, but three burns on the enemy team with a 100% chance to stun all enemies. There has not ever been, aside from Meteor Fall, another 100% AoE stun in Epic 7's history, and that is because of how damaging Meteor Fall was. So now, let me set the stage for you, again, in case you forgot, what Epic 7 looked like in 2019. We had just gotten Hunt 11, so up until this point, most people are only rocking 67 to level 70 gear. So 80 plus gear is incredibly scarce. We do not have reforged gear yet at this point. Additionally, boots, rings, necklaces, these things are only easily obtainable from things like Labyrinth or from specific events. So people don't have great right side pieces. They are using whatever they got, whether it's blue, purple, or red. Speaking of colors of gear, the way that gear rolled back then was completely different. Red still works the same way it does now, as you know it in 2024, but blue gear started with two subs, and at plus three got its third sub, and at plus six got its fourth sub. This obviously makes things very difficult for rolling, because you don't actually know what the four sub stats are on the piece of gear, until quite a bit later on. So you might get a potential good speed boot only to find out that yes, it has crit chance, crit damage, but then it goes flat health, flat defense at plus six. So therefore it's not really usable and charms are way harder to get because the only way you can really get them is the challenge mode that predated Hall of Trials as well as Labyrinths with the ancient coins and silver transmit stones, which 
excuse me, unless you're a whale, you don't have a lot of those. So quality of gear, kind of bad. So that means having effect resistance, kind of not realistic. So your other way to survive meteor fall would be obviously immunity. Oh wait, right. We don't actually have immunity set. This was the patch that gave us the Azamanicon. Sell you a super broken unit locked behind $100 mystic packs. And the solution is here, immunity set in a brand new hunt that is so difficult that most of the player base can't actually get it. And even if you actually are able to clear the Azamanic hunt, the way that gear drops in Hunt 11, it's pretty much garbage. You most of the time are getting 70 pieces. Very rarely are you getting 85s. And when you get 85s, it's like 75% of the time it's a blue. And like 24% of the time, it's purple. And only 1% of the time is it red. So most of the gear you're getting, it's blue. And it's probably not going to roll very well. So good luck actually getting some realistically good immunity gear. So that leaves us now with outspeeding it. Which, if you're familiar with how this channel works and my stance on things, I think that when just outspeeding things is the only solution, it's bad game design because of how the RNG works for the gearing in this game. So how people would try to combat Silverblade Armenta at this time was to play Righteous Thief Ruzid, who we talked about in a previous history video because he was a premier CR pusher. 20% CR was a big deal, right? And he gave a speed imprint. So he was like the go-to character to try to make sure that you didn't get outsped by Silverblade Armenta because if you did, your team just got stunned and then burned to hell and you just died. There was just no real counterplay to it for most of the player base, right? Now, the problem with that is that the ML3 star Harado basically just directly countered Ruzin and just took away that line of avenue. So if you had Silverblade Armenta and you had Harado, you were kind of golden. You were in a pretty good spot. I should know from experience. I was one of the lucky people that actually got Silverblade Armenta. She was my very first Moonlight 5 star in it, but the entire game. After months of seeing my friends get stuff, I finally got her. And I also got really lucky and got Ruel of Light like a year later from the Galaxy, or not a year, I should say a week later, my bad, from the uh, Galaxy Summons. So here is uh, some fun pictures for you guys to actually look at from my time getting Silverblade Aramenta. I, once getting her, immediately went from challenger into champion because champion was the realm of like the whales right most of the player base was in challenger it was very difficult for you to climb into champion at this point uh, only like really the best of the best were there and me with my crappy gear that i had from low spending uh, silverblade armenta was so op that i just got a free ticket into actually into champion and later on as we'll talk about eventually into legend so here are some of my characters. Here is the aforementioned Harado. Take a look at my gear. Uh, my right side, it's garbage by today's standards, right? There's no reforges. You can see there's a 67 red body, which is considered very good at the time. Uh, we don't have charms to level up our accessories. So this is basically what we got and what we're rocking with with Harado, right? Stats are pretty bad by today's standards. Even like the accessory uh, artifact here, not super great. And here is my Silverblade Aramenta. This is what she looked like when I hit Legend for the very first time. It's not as impressive as it seems. The big standout here is the uh, effectiveness at 112, which when I show you my Destina, you'll start to realize why 100 effectiveness, it's kind of broken, right? Not Nothing super uh, insane, at least by today's standards on this character. But 200 speed on Silverblade was considered like okay back then. For reference, the like Giga Whales, they were around 235 to 240 speed. Like there was, it was a big deal that a content creator like Sky King had like a 240 speed Assassin Sid. Like you were not outspeeding 240 speed, right? So the basic ways again to counter were Ruzid, pray they didn't have Harado, um, or have immunity gear. The problem is if you had immunity gear, they could go Basar and strip your immunity, uh, and Harado to deny your CR pusher, and then stun you with Silverblade Armenta. So, yeah, not really great options to beat Silverblade at this time. Just in case you want to see some of the other characters I played during this time. Here's my Luna uh, on Gavlit's gear, because that was what was the best gear for most players at the time. You can see the 71 necklace, because again, accessories really hard to come by at this point. 
Here's my Crimson Armin. Look how tanky she is. Look how crazy this is, right? 1288 defense, 16k health. Back then, it wasn't great, but it was considered pretty decent. Uh, by today's standards, this is pretty much trash, right? We can agree this is pretty much trash. Here's my Ruel of Light. Again, I had immunity set, but I had to use a 67 to get it. And the reason for this is because if my opponent wasn't playing Basar, and they were also playing the Araminta Mirror against me, then my Ruel got to revive my Silverblade Araminta, and then I get to turn the tables and, and kill them. Remember, back in 2019, Moonlight 5 stars were so incredibly rare. Like, you might have one or two on your account total. I was fortunate enough that the two that I had were Silverblade and Ruel, just, who just happened to be the two strongest ones in the entire game. And here is my Destina, in case you want to see it. A whopping 109 effect resistance. My gear is not all done at this point because I was trying really hard uh, to actually get enough effect resistance. Little did I know that 109 doesn't do squat to my 112 effect in a silver blade, and there are people with better silver blades than me. So, again, resisting silver blade was pretty much futile. The thing is, at the time, people didn't really think too much about like silver blade Araminta because most of the player base didn't have her unless you got insanely lucky. Because remember, Mystics were very rare you got like three pulls a week as the average player and it was 200 for a pity so unless you were a big money spender you didn't have silver blade so for most people public enemy number one at this point in time was falcon or clary which she probably was the best character in epic 7 still upon araminta's release because of this trust rune if you don't recall or you just don't know back then uh, falcon or clary had built an rnl at a 15 percent rate and people would build her incredibly fast with effectiveness and if Clary high rolled you, you just lost because she would just take basically infinite turns. So this character was stupid broken. And just like the Holy Trinity before it, they nerfed this character. Nobody batted an eye, but people got it in their heads. If you scroll down here, I believe there is the selector announcement. No, it's not in this post, but yeah, they got it in their heads. Nerf means selector, right? As established with the Holy Trinity and established with Falcon or Clary. Now, this leads us into April where Araminta is starting to become a problem, but it's not that big of a deal because everyone is more excited about this announcement. For months, Epic 7 had teased that a world-class IP that people knew about would be coming. And th when this image came out, people literally just went, huh? What the hell is this? Now, for us who play fighting games, we knew right away. This was Guilty Gear, baby, and I was stoked. I remember as soon as this came out, I went, I grabbed my cell phone. I called my buddy Crest and I was like, the collab is Guilty Gear, let's go. And he was like, oh yeah, that's actually a pretty good thing. But like, he didn't know too much about it. And I explained to him, it was like Blaze Blue. It was basically Arc System Works previous fighting game. And he's like, well, Blaze Blue is great. Guilty Gear is gonna be great. This was a great option. But some people were kind of disappointed by it being Guilty Gear because people wanted other things like Demon Slayer as the collab, which was very popular at the time, or Overlord, <laughs> which I found this post by, this is a good trip down memory lane. Overlord collab, they wanted this one instead. Imagine getting Ein, Shaltir, and Albedo. Just, just imagine, dude, my wallet will explode if Albedo comes out. So... Now maybe you have some idea as to why they went for Overlord, because this was a pretty popular sentiment even back then. But yeah, we got Guilty Gear Exer 2, specifically Revelator 2, right? Uh, we got this as the collab, and Revelator 2 saw the introduction of Dizzy, as well as Biken into the game. I believe Dizzy came a little bit earlier, I think she was Revelator 1, but most people were of the opinion in the Guilty Gear community, at least the more casual players, myself included, uh, took the stance of no bike and no buy, um, which hardcore Guilty Gear players probably hate that stance because uh, bike and players are usually hated uh, a lot because the people they're not usually seen as people who really want to play Guilty Gear. Anyways, that's for another time. But we got at the end of April the Guilty Gear collab, right? And we got our free soul. We got our girl Biken, which I'll show you my Biken stats here on the screen in case you want to see what mine look like. She was one of the characters that I rotated in for like, uh, I want to say 
uh, mid-range style compositions. And sometimes I also cleaved with her. I used her as kind of like a bridge in cleave. Yes, at one point I was a cleaver. You always have people like ATK and Boil Noodles come into my chat and say I need to become a cleaver or I should become a cleaver. I don't need to become a cleaver. I was a cleaver. I'll prove it to you. Here is my team that I played in arena offense in Legend for several months. If that team does not scream cleave to you, then I don't know what does. This was my cleaver arc. I started Epic 7 as a cleaver. I fell out of it because my gear doesn't allow me to actually do it. I just was struggling to stay in Champion 5 as a cleaver. And I just happened to be outfitted to be a much stronger bruiser player. But that's for another time. Anyways, this patch also introduced... Two new characters to the Mystic Summon as Araminta came out. Crescent Moon Rin and Sage Ball and Cezanne. And this, these two characters specifically, kind of really made me angry. Because this was the first time that I could remember the content creators in Epic 7, at least the former ones, I won't name names, really missed the mark. And I feel like it did some damage to the community, right? Now let me explain. So Sage Ball and Cezanne, uh, unique design, but it's not for everybody. A lot of people didn't want to pull for this character because of how quote-unquote ugly he looked. And a lot of content creators were of the opinion that this character was terrible, right? So the thing is, this character is essentially a five-star Harado because Harado checks you for trying to go fast. Why would I play a quote-unquote worse version of Harado? Because the Cloud of Ruin gives you a 25% CR push as opposed to the 20% that Harado gave you. So Cloud of Ruin, it seems good, but it's not that strong, right? And Crescent Moon Rin here, this was the character that everybody was talking about. The character that everybody claimed would break the game, right? Because she was so OP. She, yes, sure, she was potentially an answer to Araminta. But she was considered maybe OP at the start. So let's look at this skill set here. Heckle. Attack Sammy at the ring. Granting a random buff to the caster for one turn. And Eye Catcher here. Steals two buffs and grants their effects to allies. Now the big one here, Curtain Call. Dispels all of the target's buffs before granting immunity to all allies for two turns. So... This character was as fast as Acid, like the fastest character that anybody would actually play in the game. Yes, you had Kron, but nobody played Kron at this point, right? So Rin was the answer. If you had Rin, you could outspeed your opponents, you could get immunity, and you could Silver Blade Araminta them, and there was nothing they could do about it. And that, I don't think, could be further from the truth, because just you read Cloud of Ruin and realize um, it just dispels the immunity and puts you to sleep. And you can't cut in front of Sage Ball and Cezanne. So this was the first time in my E7 career where I was like, this feels like missing. Like at, there's two ways to look at it, right? Content creators are either, one, don't have a very strong grasp of the fundamentals of the game. In which case, that's not good because you would want your community to be informed. You'd want new players to feel informed about characters. And at worst, it's disingenuous because you're downplaying a character because you don't want to actually have to play against it, so you tell everybody to not pull. So this was, like, not to sound, like, bragging or anything. I, I Like, me and my friends were like, you guys have got this all kind of wrong. And this is the first point, in, at least for me, where I considered maybe jumping into the content creation game to actually correct people. Because the opinion was, Sage Ball was just uh, an answer to Silverblade Araminta, and as you guys might know from the history of Epic 7, you might think, oh, this is an anti-cleave character. No, no, no. It's a cleave anchor now. And that's exactly what happened. So for Arena in this game, what ended up happening was we had Silverblade Araminta being joined by Sage Ball and Cezanne. There was no real out to it. Once you added Crimson Armin and Ruel of Light, it was an unbeatable arena team. There was just no way to beat it, right? Sage, Ball and Cezanne just stripped your immunity, which was the only counterplay. He went faster than all of the fast characters, so there was no way for you to actually break out of it. And if you somehow were able to stabilize, you couldn't do damage because Crimson Armin was absolutely beyond broken back then. And Ruel Light just gave you the revive and the cleanse for the sustain. So there's just nothing you could do about it. 
absolutely game-breaking team composition, right? And of course, it gets even worse halfway through the Guilty Gear collab with the introduction of Dizzy. So for those of you who don't know what Dizzy did, uh, her S1 was an AoE stun. Yikes, right? S2 was a CR pushback that extended buff duration, debuff durations, which means that the stun from Silverblade Araminta could be extended with proper speed tuning to two turns. So you really didn't get to play the game. And then the S3 was a two turn speed down, a two turn attack down, and a two turn blind. And the only way to beat it, you guessed it, was immunity, which is a set that people don't have, or on, you know, Rin, which is an ML that you probably don't have because you don't have currency to pull for either Galaxy Summons because they were harder to get back then or Mystic Summons, which you weren't buying for, uh, packs for. And that still just lost the ball and says on anyway. So yeah, it was a pretty dire time, right? Absolutely miserable uh, metagame with Araminta and Dizzy everywhere, not allowing you to play the game. You were just slowed and stunned forever. And here we have the June 12th update, which got us to episode 2. So people who were PvE enjoyers at least could be like, okay, well, uh, PvP is a cluster. But hey, we got God Killer now. It's going to be a good time. And after Sage Ball and Cezanne rotated out, we got this little girl over here, who you may know as Fallen Cecilia. Right? So Fallen Cecilia came out. Nobody pulled for her because she was considered unplayable. Because why would you play this character in the face of Dizzy? Uh, in the face of Araminta and the face of Sage Ball and Cezanne. She doesn't do anything to any of these characters. And also, she mitigates less damage as a tank than Crimson Armin does. So, nobody pulled really for Fallen Cecilia. She just completely went by the wayside. Now, it's been about three months at this point since Silverblade Araminta has come out. And everybody is complaining about how BS she is, how stupidly broken she is, how broken Ball and Cezanne is. So we're at the point now where the Mystic characters coming out are just broken. I mean, Fallen Cecilia was like considered decent, but not, but basically like a budget option if you didn't already have Crimson Armor. So people were demanding that their one or two ML5s they had on their account could be just as good. It's Silver Blade Armenta. They wanted buffs. Arbiter Vildred was garbage. We need Arbiter Vildred to be stronger. Silver Blade, or not Silver Blade, I'm sorry. Spectre Tenebria is a poison unit. That's terrible because the three star Kyrus does something like that already, and she's way better and easier to get. My Spectre Tenebria should do something more. People were asking for better balance. And here on June 14th, we got developer notes, right? Hello, this is Super Creative. Today we'll be sharing with you the Epic 7 Festa Frequently Asked Questions. They're talking about increasing the amount of Mulligoras you got in your account. And you look at the balance changes. Recently, we received many questions regarding the balancing of new Moonlight Heroes, specifically Araminta and Sage Ball. And we consider these questions to be very important. Moonlight Heroes have been designed particularly for player versus player content. Currently, we do not offer any PvE endgame content that allows players to compete with each other, so heroes that are commonly used in PvP content have a higher value. Later on, we plan on revamping quests and introducing new and more challenging PvE content, such as World Boss, which... That one did not age too well, guys and girls. So that other heroes can be used in additional content and become more valuable. In addition to these changes, we will also be monitoring the usage of newly released heroes and balancing older heroes so that their range of selection isn't drastically different when compared to the newly released heroes. Additionally, we also plan on creating new metas and strategies with the release of new heroes. At the Epic Festa, we announced balance changes that will occur on June 27th. We will go into the finer details of these changes in a separate notice. First, though, we'd like to explain the main intention of the balance changes with this notice. So people asked for it, and they responded with Arbiter Vildred. Revival is a key component for Arbiter Vildred. However, after Revival, some players found it difficult to deal damage to continue to survive. And that's because Dark Contract revived you at the same CR that you used to be at. So if he was at 40% CR and died, he revives at 40% and you just kill him again. So, we made some changes to Arbiter Vildred, right? So, we, when the improved Arbiter Vildred resurrects through his passive skill Dark Contract, 
He grants himself 100% CR as well as an attack buff. In most situations, immediate action is possible after resurrection, and with the increased attack buff, powerful attacks can be made with the skill Dark Blade, right? Uh, so we go over here and see damage increase. We gave him a 30% more damage increase and increased his blind chance and made it so that he gets the enhanced version of Dark Blade upon revival. Cool. We're making ML5s better, right? So, here we go. June 27th is when we got the hero balances that were talked about. We improved stuff, right? We brought Arbiter Vildred in line, right? With everybody. And you can see there's some other characters that are in here. Corvus, which this guy was kind of a disaster too, let's be honest, right? Lots. Bloodblade Corinne, right? There was a lot of other stuff that was in this patch, but Arbiter Vildred was kind of the big one, and they would roll out buffs for other characters later on, like, say, Judge Kise and uh, Spectre Tenebria. But Arbiter was front and center for this new initiative to make older ML5s just as good as Silverblade Araminta, right? And people were super happy about this, because finally, their one ML5 that they had on their account was going to be just as good as Araminta, right? It was going to be just as good as Sage Ball and Cezanne. Right? That was the big thing that everybody was happy about. So how did it turn out? So here we go. Epic 7 developer and player conference live stream. Set for Monday, July 15th. Um, basically, it went over like, like a wet fart. Um... Arbiter Vildred's damage was just so damn high that he just killed everybody. Like, everybody? <laughs> like, if you had Arbiter Vildred, you don't have to worry about Silverblade Armenta because even if they had uh, Ruel of Light and Crimson Armin, you could just revive Press S3 and just win the game. And if you had Alexis Basket, then you just got to win the game pretty much for free. So... We went from one problem to another one that was significantly worse. So yeah, here is the link from five years ago to this actual live conference that was linked here on Reddit. And the top post kind of explains the sense of it. Because you just went from three months of a metagame where there's no answer to a new metagame where there's no answer. Not gonna lie, it's quite bold of them to hold a live press conference with angry fans. This could be very ugly. I wonder how they, they're they going to get through this PR. Well, that conference is still live, courtesy of the amazing Tenha. So if you don't know, Tenha is a Genshin Impact slash Hoyoverse content creator. He's also, I think, covering Nikkei now. He is, he absolutely blew up with Genshin Impact on that game. But before that, he was an Epic 7 content creator. And if you're familiar with the Hoyoverse space, he was basically like the Mr. Pokey that we had for our community. Mr. Pokey would basically translate the CN community stuff as a favor for the global audience so that we can kind of learn how other servers are talking about the game, what strategies they're going about things and so forth. Tenha was that for us with the Korean audience. Tenha was invaluable back in the day for Epic 7, at least in my opinion, because we didn't have Mashu and Nue. We did not have community managers and official E7 English streams, right? All we had were Reddit and Twitter posts from the community uh, advisors that we talked about in the Luna video. We didn't have streams. So all we could do was rely on Tenha and his translations to give us the most up-to-date news on the state of the game. And as you can kind of probably guess by seeing it on your screen now, this conference did not go over very well, as you can see by the donation. Whenever Smilegate intervened, basically talking about when SG purchased Super Creative and decided to take over the game, it went bad. You can see they're saying SG is a cancer. Yeah, people were pretty angry throughout this. Like, I'm just going to skim through some of Tenha's videos so you can see some of the sentiments that are said here. You can, I'll link this stream, by the way, down in uh, the video's description if you want to take a look at some of this stuff. But there's some pretty crazy things. Uh, like, they're talking about why can't, why do leaves not recover 
full stamina, right? Yeah. We, and they don't talk about how it's basically, it's a policy that they decided early on. I believe there's one that I wanted to talk about here at the end here, where they talk about, um, they talk about specifically why they don't nerf ML5s, right? People are asking, please nerf the Moonlight 5 stars. Like, okay, we get it. You made broken units. You should actually walk them back. Their stance on some of this stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, ML Aramenta and Hero, other ML heroes are too strong. Just like we said, we really want to nerf and balance the game. But if we do that, I think we're showing a lack of responsibility. Keep in mind, the person speaking is Director Unit Kim. This is basically the person in charge of E7. By nerfing the ML5 characters, we're showing a lack of responsibility. We'll try to balance it first. If it doesn't work, then we'll nerf them, right? So they're going to try to see if they can salvage the ship. Now, I don't know a ton about Korean work culture. But I have worked as a consultant for Japanese card games in the past. And I will say that from my experience, trying to get changes or to getting them to admit fault is kind of like pulling teeth. Because they, as a culture, it, the worst thing you can do is admit wrongdoing. It is a big problem there. To give you an example, we had a mechanic that we were working on. It didn't feel fun to play. It was very clunky and just not really strong. And it was supposed to be the headliner for a product that we were working on. So it had to be fun and engaging because otherwise it wouldn't sell. Now, we went through, I wanna say sun up to sundown, three days, me and my team arguing with the Japanese development team that the mechanic just wasn't very good. And we were making suggestions and they were all rejected. Because to take our suggestions, our feedback into account would be to admit wrongdoing. And that is a big no-no. It would make the director, the lead game designer, look bad. So we can't have that. So instead, we'll try to find workarounds without changing the mechanic too much because to scrap the whole mechanic and start over is unacceptable. Eventually, after three days of constant protesting we finally got our way the mechanic was fun interesting good the game was great awesome but for those three days it felt like a nightmare because it's like talking to a wall they don't they see it as a lack of responsibility or like they they messed up and that is unacceptable to them right so that is what i could only assume was the case now to wrap this whole thing up they spent the next six weeks trying to figure out a solution and it never materialized. So the only thing that they could do was to have arguably one of the highest or I should say longest balance patches of all time here. So here is the September 4th balance adjustment patch. So it's all of this got changed. All of this got changed, right? All of this got changed, including these artifacts. And how and to cap it all off, the worst decision in Epic 7 history. That in my opinion, the absolute worst decision they have ever made. With this patch, they instituted a Moonlight Hero recall period. Right? Level 50 or higher, Arbor of Vildred, Sage Balance is on. Silverblade Aramenta or Crimson Armin, right? Please note that only heroes acquired before the recall availability period are eligible. This, you can see the recall bot, they explain how it works. This picture is what keeps me up at night. This picture is literally why Epic 7's balance is rough. Because in May and June of 2019, the player base demanded specific fixes and Smogate delivered. Unfortunately, those balance patches did even more harm to the game and made the balance even worse. And people were outraged. They lost content creators. They lost tons of players, tons of money, right? And so to make it right, they basically gave everybody everything they wanted Gave you the selector, the refund on all of the characters that were broken. 
and then let you just choose whatever character you wanted. And for somebody like me who had Ball, who had Araminta, and pulled a second Araminta, I was set because the previously unignored or ignored Fallen Cecilia, that became the de facto best tank by default because she was budget Araminta or uh, budget Armin, and now Armin's terrible. So I got to get Fallen Cecilia. Well, Ball is terrible, so I could just get Dark Corvus and Arbiter Vildred was still broken and I just got to coast so everybody who was already broken just got to pull way ahead of everybody else because of this terrible Moonlight selector system and because they had to compensate everybody for their mess ups they don't want to do it anymore you guys already saw from this like Ten Haga conference they got I encourage you to please go back and look at this they got basically crucified publicly because of how they handled balance from that summer of 2019. And they don't ever want to repeat that again. It was bad. Like it was it was an embarrassment. So basically, I feel like as a company, they have closed the doors to nerfs because to nerf everything is to basically go through this whole PR fiasco yet again. So they will do what they get for the, their, to use their words here, or I should say Ten Ha's translation, right? Showing lack of responsibility. They will do what they see as the responsible thing and just power creep or make a new solution that they think will answer the problem. And all this stems from one girl being too strong with no counterplay at the start. Solar Blade Araminta. Now you know why it took me so long to make this video. Because... It's not a pretty story. And the history topic that we're going to talk about after this. Well, if we go to the end of summer of 2019 here. We got a character that uh, also was a bit too strong. But again, that's for another video. If you liked the video, as always, leave a like or subscribe. And hopefully you enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week. Catch you in the next one. Later now.